So the Lord be with you. With Let's pray. Search our hearts, O oh God, and see if there be any wicked way in us, and lead us into the way everlasting. Amen. So two weeks ago when I was teaching, we looked at imprecatory psalms and lament psalms. That's anger and sadness. And so closely related to that, today we're talking about enemies and injustice. So somehow when I wrote the schedule, I did this to myself. <laughs> or either the Lord superseding as he usually does said, I know the ones you need. Hence, Father Andrew gets to teach on joy. Leah gets to do this. And I did, I did need it. Um, one of the hard things about teaching, those of you that have done it, you know this. If it's going to be any good, the Lord's going to ask you to live it in your own life. So if you're teaching on enemies and injustice, you can expect the enemy to come after you and somehow to encounter injustice in your week. It, it's coming. Thanks be to God. That's how it works. Some of us are not comfortable with in, enemy language in the Psalms. Um, after all, didn't Jesus tell us that we are to love our enemies and to bless those who curse us? Anybody got an easy and magic formula for loving your enemies and blessing people who curse you? <laughs> Distance and good boundaries, I like that. <laughs> yes, but that, that's work, isn't it? You know, especially if they look like are kin to you or something. It's really hard. Can we call somebody our enemy as Christians? Yes, I'm seeing a nod. Yes, because the Psalms do, the scripture does. So what does it look like to say that you have enemies in the way that the psalmist does? Well, a few things. First of all, it's not in the abstract. It's not just generic enemy. Um, David Taylor writes in his books, enemies are those who do enemy-like things, particular enemies that behave in God-denying, image-of-God-abusing ways. So I want to read that to you again. Taylor writes, enemies are those who do enemy-like things. So we're talking about the way people behave. They do particular things that are God-denying and image-of-God-abusing. So in Jesus' day, enemies showed up as religious leaders. That's scary. Roman rulers. If you were in government or politics, you should be quaking in your boots right now. Sometimes as friends, remember what Jesus said to Peter? Get thee behind me, Satan. That's the hardest. So those who behave in God-denying ways, those who behave in ways that abuse the image of God, as I read that, I just, I literally typed in my teaching notes, Eek, is that me? Because sometimes, am I the enemy someone else is praying against? Because I have sometimes behaved in ways that abuse the image of God. And I have at times behaved in ways that are God denying. Or I've just behaved in ways that are not God affirming, which for me, if I'm not affirming God, I'm, I'm his enemy. I don't think there is middle ground for us. So these psalms, what these psalms, they're called psalms of enmity, enemy psalms. They name the corrosive nature of life-destroying enemy activity. Things like senseless evil, abusive conduct, neglect to love, God-awful diseases, all those things we could call enemies of God. Our culture does not really like us to do this. Our culture doesn't want to name things as they actually are. So one of the things we like to do is have a euphemism for everything. So right now we have a conflict in the Middle East. It's a war. It's a war with carnage and terror, death. death. You might have a conflict with your spouse or a coworker. 
that's not a conflict. That's a war. But we do this, and the Psalms don't. They re- so that's why some of the language can get uncomfortable. The Psalms refuse to minimize or ignore enemy behavior. They refuse to let, and I love this, they refuse to let evil have the last word in history. So often when you're reading these kinds of Psalms, they're going to end with a phrase like, be my refuge. Save us, O God. So think about that for a minute. You know, there's just all this just throw their heads against the rocks, Lord. Take them out. Swallow them up. Let the earth open up. You know, all of this strong, strong language. But the, but the psalmist will come back to, oh, God, save us. Which in a way is just in that brief little line to say, our God is bigger than all that. My God is bigger than my enemy. He, he who is in us has overcome the world. Christ is the victor. He overcomes. So there are six things about enemies in the Psalms I want us to look at. And one of those I want us to use Psalm 18 for. So I gave you a handout of that. Um, if you will notice, I have bold printed. And I probably missed some stuff. If you were one of my former students... <clears throat> at Joseph Hickson. Don't catch my errors here. <laughs> he's, a, he's a good enough student, he could. I may not have caught everything, but I went through and tried to just mark words if I were teaching you rhetoric, words that would be inflammatory, that would really point to this idea of enemy language. And so as you just scan that Psalm 18, and it is a long one. It is front and back. And it printed in this weird way, because I don't know how to do columns. It went 1 through 15, and then you have to flip on the back to go to 16 to 25. And then you have to go back to the right side of the page, 26 to 40. And then on the right side of the back, so I'm going to get you to exercise your wrists a little (laughs) bit. So just take a minute. I'm going to give you just a few seconds of silence. And when you just scan down and just read to yourself, these words and phrases. Notice verse 38 on the right-hand side of the page. I thrust them through so that they were not able to rise. I thought of, um, what's her name? In the scriptures where she drives the stake through the guy's head. Jael. Jael, that's it. Thank you. I kept saying Jabez. That's like, that's not right. Yes, Jael. She's the woman in the tent that drives the stake with the hammer. I mean, this is, this is that. I, maybe it was a sword through the gut. I don't know. But I thrust them through so they were not able to rise. They fell under my strength. Over on the, if you flip the page over on the back side at verse 42. I'm just pulling out a couple. I beat them fine as dust. You know, if we were translating that into our vernacular, we would say, I pulverized my enemy. This is the Bible. This is Holy Scripture. Yes, this is battle. This is describing his war. He says in verse 34, He, God, trains my hands for war. David Taylor says about Psalm 18, this is not a psalm for polite company. (laughs) There are a couple of others we'll look out like that. The world is full of fractured relationships 
and hostile dynamics. I see Christy back there. Can I get an amen in her line of work? <laughs> she sees that every day. The world is full of fractured relationships and hostile dynamics. What is the human response to evil? When you see evil, when you encounter injustice, what is just the human reaction? Anger. 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 To want to turn away, rage, disgust, disgust. more evil, evil. Despair. despair, grief. You know, just to just you know, usually the first reactions will be the more anger and vengeful, and then then we get to grief and despair. The worst this pop. Is, this is this psalm is David. Yes. And David has been to war, and God has rescued him. Yes. Okay, and he's describing what happened. Now, well, there is one area I have trouble with. Um, verse 20. The Lord dealt with me according to my righteousness. I have to say no. <laughs> according to the plenty of my hand, he rewarded me. <laughs> no. He rewarded him because he loves him. Yeah. And we read, as Richard Hayes, one of, I think he was one of Father Andrew's professors, I've studied his work, haven't been taught by him, but he says we read backwards. We read the Psalms with a New Testament lens. So if we claim to have clean hands, it is because who has cleaned our hands? Jesus. Jesus. And who has cleaned our hearts? Yeah, that's some questions for David when we get there. You and I will get in line and say, can we, can we talk about this? Because what were you seeing that you could write that? To Doug's point, that God loves him, first of all, because he delighted in me. He was not so righteous when he was... Oh, like adultery and murder? You mean that, Lynn? <laughs> yeah, those. He would be toast. Yes. Yes. But this is David's song. Yes. Do you remember when he? Well, we'll get to it in one ten. He's, David calls someone, maybe the pre-incarnate Christ, my Lord. And he refers to, I saw my Lord sitting next to the Lord who had made his enemies his footstool. Yes. We read that and say, that's Jesus. Be interesting what David's notion of that would have been, or that sounds like the wrong word, but what his concept of what that what that was like. I have a feeling he's he, he doesn't treat us based on our righteousness. I don't want to be judged according to my righteousness because as I prepared this, as I said, I saw myself I saw in myself some enemy like behavior. And it, I was very aware of, if I can pray these psalms about people who offend me or hurt me, then there's someone out there praying these same psalms about me because I've offended and hurt them. And I know I have. We all have. We all have. So our, we we're talking about our reactions to, to experience an injustice. That's, that is the human response. Unless we beat ourselves up about that, that's actually a good thing. Because the, the worst thing would be to see injustice, to see enemy-like behavior, to see somebody with God abusing, with ways that abuse the image of God or abuse those that God loves. To see that and be apathetic, that is the worst possible reaction we could have as humans. And so I think we're given these psalms in some sense to help us express what we should be expressing. A third thing you might notice about 
these kinds of psalms is that anybody can become our enemy. Anybody. And the harm that comes from them is real. And if you look at, I think I printed for you Psalm 55, 12, and 13. This is betrayal. This is the, this is the ultimate level of injustice for most of us, for all of us. It is not an enemy who taunts me. Then I could bear it if it was that other person that I barely know on the other side of the world. It is not an adversary who deals insolently with me. Then I could hide from him. But it is you, a man, my equal, my companion, my familiar friend. And I wrote in my margin to myself, perhaps it's in my own household, in my workplace, in my closest friendships. This is a relationship where it's hard to keep distance, where it's hard to draw a boundary because they're there every day. And they've behaved with enemy-like behavior. And I, I just love finding this and knowing those two verses are there. When I'm struggling with that person and trying to tell myself I'm supposed to love this person. I'm supposed to, you know, love my enemies and pray for them. That's what Jesus said. And then I see, but I'm... This is hard. This is the hardest because you were my companion. You were my friend. This would be someone who was trusted. The fourth point about these kind of psalms is that they're very, and you've already seen this as an example in Psalm 18, they're very visceral. There's real strong imagery in them. So this is the opposite of that minimizing I mentioned. The psalmist does not use euphemistic language. So look at the example in 109. The purpose of this kind of language is to actually name the violent and sinful ways of human beings in hopes that God will step in and do something. And to borrow from the, the counseling world a minute, we cannot name, I mean, we cannot tame what we will not name. We have to name it. James writes, confess your sins one to another that you may be healed. There is so much value in just, even to one other person, just saying out loud what is in your heart. That is how we're healed. And of course the Psalms, as we talked about, even those that are clearly very individual, they're still the prayer book of the people. And so that even those psalms are read and experienced communally. So there's value in this communally. Look at this psalm, number 109, and just notice the rhetoric here. He says, May his posterity be cut off. May his name be blotted out in the second generation. May the iniquity of his fathers be remembered before the Lord, and let not the sin of his mother be blotted out. I mean, he's smack-talking somebody's mother right here. That's fighting words, right? <laughs> Let them be before the Lord continually, that he may cut off the memory from them from the earth. For he did not remember to show kindness, but pursued the poor and needy and brokenhearted, to put them to death. And when we talk about justice in a few minutes, we'll talk about something called the quartet of the vulnerable the four most vulnerable populations in ancient Israel. The poor, the needy, the brokenhearted. That's sort of a trio of the vulnerable right there. And whomever he's praying against here, he's saying, he went after them. He not only didn't show them kindness, he went after them to put them down, to put them to death. So pay him back, God. That's the kind of strength of language. He loved to curse. Well, then let curses come upon him. He did not delight in blessing, so may it be far from him. So really strong, visceral language here. The fifth thing I want you to notice about these kinds of psalms, praying against one's enemies is not a matter of just venting or throwing a tantrum. I didn't know this a lot for a long time, and so I like to vent, and I would vent, and I did vent. 
I'm getting some raised eyebrows over here from my husband of 36 years. <laughs> so what I, what I love here is there is this place with the psalm of pouring it out. But what we come, the purpose of that is to relinquish it. To relinquish it and also to self-examine. That's the hard part. But what these enemy prayers, these psalms of enmity invite us to do is to pour it out to God and then to ask God, search my heart. Is there anything else there I can't see, God? And now please help me and do something about it. You know, just kind of a spent. Like after a kid throws a temper tantrum, they usually want a nap. And you do too. Because we've got <laughs> getting an amen from the Pillsbury step back there. Yes. You, you, it's, it's an exhaustion that comes after that ramp. So let's look at that psalm. By, by example, I've given you Psalm 139, verses 19 to 22 there. And y'all, you've heard me say this is my favorite psalm. This is the one that God, you knit me together in my mother's womb. You, check, you know, all the marrow and the bones and all the cells and DNA. And you just wonderfully made me. And then there's this weird, like, piece of enmity psalm in the middle of this otherwise beautiful psalm. And this is that section I've given you. Oh, that you would slay the wicked, O God. O men of blood, depart from me. They speak against you with malicious intent. Your enemies take your name in God. This is like tattletaling right here. It's like saying, God, do you hear them? God, do you see them? Look what they're doing. Do you see the way he spoke to me? Do you see what she's doing? That's what's going on here. And then in verse 21, Do I not hate those who hate you, O Lord? And do I not loathe those who rise up against you? And I, this can be read two ways. And I... I think there's sort of this confidence you can read that with. Like, God, I'm on your side. I know you don't want those children abused. I know you don't want, you know, this situation going on in my neighbor's marriage. You know, so this can be read that way. as God, I'm on your side, and don't, don't you see this, and aren't you going to do something? But it can also be read a little bit as self-examination. Do I not hate those who hate you, oh God? It is being posed as a question. And, think I'm on the right side. I'm mad about this. It looks wrong to me. Is it wrong, God? Am I on your side? Am I with you? So he continues in verse 23, and there is the self, unless you think it was only a vague suggestion. Here's the real self-examination. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts, and see if there be any grievous way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. So I'm supposed to get mad at injustice. I'm supposed to be despairing when people are acting in ways that abuse the image of God and that mislead others and mistreat others. And yet, what the psalmist is teaching me here is, but I'm also to spin that and lay myself before God and say, is there any of that in me? Is there any way in my life that I'm leading someone astray, abusing your image. Yes? Yeah, there's something in no-go. Uh, there's a prayer. It's a loose and a place. Yes. And that's kind of what this is all, all speaking to. Yes. You loose in the name of the Lord whose son was given and blood washed away all of our sins, and you replace that evil with. Yes, it's, she's talking about a prayer that you learn in the Novo class if you've taken that, a prayer of binding and loosing. And it's based on the scripture of whatever is bound on earth shall be bound in heaven. What is loosed in heaven shall be loosed on earth. And so you bind evil and you loose the things that, that you want in your life or someone else's life. And so you can you know, bind hatred, bind prejudice, bind... You know, a spirit of poverty or scarcity in, in your life or someone's, you would pray for someone this way. And then you would call for God to loose a spirit of generosity in that person or loose a spirit of, of a tongue that gives life and doesn't speak death. So thank you for, if y'all, that's a commercial for Nova. If you've not taken that class with Father Allen, strongly recommend it. The sixth feature, yes, Lynn. I, I love it that he is so. Completely honest here in verse 22. I 
hate them with complete I hate them. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's akin to murder. Because Jesus said, if you hate your brother, you've already murdered him in your heart. Yes, I'm so glad you brought that up because I meant to address that and I went right over it. But he has, the, he has an escape clause. I'm sorry? He has an escape clause in verse 24. Yes. It's like, yes. having said all that, Lord, search me. If I'm wrong, lead me. Yes. Right. Yes. We all hear that Doug called it an escape clause, and I love that. And it's, I, I, I hate him, God, but if this is not your holy hatred, if this is not your sense of justice in me, then show me that. Because maybe it is just good old Leah doesn't like you kind of anger, or you've ticked her off today, anger. Um, Perfect hatred, which would imply a wholeness and a, a godly hatred. And I think the, the general reading of that is, I hate what you hate, God. And just oftentimes when I encounter a scripture like this that I kind of catch in my throat, I find myself thinking, I, I don't know if that's me. And so then I've just put a little cross by to remind myself, turn that into a prayer, Leah. God, I want to hate what you hate. And if I don't, will you work in my heart to make me hate it? And I want to love what you love. I mean, I, I bear your name. I claim to follow you. I say that you live in me. I want to love what you love. And that's a lifetime of following him and learning and listening to him. But yeah, we, I think we think more about asking God to help us love what he loves and not so much about, Lord, help me, help me to hate what you hate. In the perfect sense. Thank you, Kathleen. That's a good word. So that leads us right into my sixth point of lesson one. Lesson two probably is going to be your take-home homework. We seek righteousness in the way Jesus taught us to do. And we'll look at Matthew 5, 43 to 45. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and the unjust. So Jesus does not deny the reality of enemies. They are real. They come in all forms, human, societal, natural, demonic. He also never tells his disciples not to use this enemy language. Remember, Jesus prayed the Psalms. He would have used this language. The verse we alluded to uh, earlier is Psalm 110.1. You will find that verse. The Lord says to my Lord, this is David, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. You will find that in all three synoptic gospels. That very psalm. So Jesus does not ask us to act like they don't exist. But he does command us to love. To be merciful as our Father in heaven is merciful. Loving our enemies requires a humility we do not have without him. We have to acknowledge our own tendency to behave in those enemy light ways. We have to admit that we too dehumanize and we too use people, abuse people, speak abusively maybe. We withhold love. We withhold mercy. We act unjustly sometimes. Or we are indifferent. Remember I said apathy is the worst possible response. We act indifferent to others' suffering. And what the Psalms, what these Psalms of enmity invite us to do is to say these things in God's presence and in the presence of each other. As we pray these Psalms throughout the year, in the lectionary, we are saying together, we know we're sinners, God. There but for your grace, there we go. And remember, the Psalms are communal stuff. So, the times are ringing. I do not get to do justice to the justice chapter. But I will say, you have a handout. I've tried to give you a Lynn Block 
kind of outline of that chapter, these two things go together. Where you've got enemy talk, you've got justice talk, and you may not like to know this, and you may not want me to end on this, but the Psalms devote two times as much space to justice as they do mercy. And it's not your and my idea of, our idea of justice. It's God's justice. So I implore you this week to go ahead and go through that handout. Read some of those justice psalms. And maybe Father Andrew can catch a little bit of that as he... <laughs> and, it's, and it's happy stuff. Yeah. He gets to talk about life and joy and all. I know. I told him I did. I did. So let's pray before we go. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you that the Psalms show us what it means to be human in all the beauty and in all the horror of that. And thank you for Jesus who took our humanity into the beautiful Holy Three, who brings us home, who cleans our hands, who searches our hearts, who brings us into your holy presence, dressed in garments of white. Lord, lead us this week into the way everlasting. Amen.